Alrighty, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Chupacabra's Lair. I am your host, Larry the Chupacabra, and we are back for another mobile game review today. And today we'll be checking out Vega Conflict from Kixai Entertainment, lovely group of developers that do a lot of um, cross-platform games that can be played both on your device or your PC or through any old computer that has a browser so that they can work on, like, Linux and Mac without trouble. And so, Vega Conflict, like a lot of um, free-to-play games available on mobile devices, we're checking it out today on iPad, as they are releasing today on iOS and iPhone. And um, Vega Conflict is a game all about managing your limited resources, your limited base capacities, timers, research, and units, in order to fight your way through space, other interstellar rebellious denizens, and uh, story missions in order to reach victory. And in this case, um, inevitable independence from the Vega Federation, which is our primary antagonist here in Vega Conflict, who, you know, they're like an evil corporate uh, federation... Uh, they they want to make us into, like, uh, wage slaves, toiling away at the edge of oblivion for very little pay, terrible working conditions. They don't even give us a hour's break at lunch in order to play Yahtzee. I mean, really, who does that? So, we're a bunch of, you know, interstellar miners. You know, we've got this lovely base, all these different crazy-looking doodads, and we've got to use all of this to fight them. So... I guess we'll start our tour by taking a look at where we get our resources from over here. So, the primary resources inside of Vega Conflict are ore, which is the little blue mineral bar at the top there that kind of looks like a target, and helium-3, which uh, is sort of our gaseous component that makes things like fuel and thrusters, and uh, a lot of our spaceships are made almost entirely from helium um, that's why they float so well in orbit. And we get all of that from these lovely, mineral-rich asteroids and meteorites and stuff, which are pulled out with mineral ore miners, helium miners, which actually look pretty cool. They've got these um, solar panels that help to convert the helium into something that we can utilize very readily. And then these ore pits, which... I guess they just bring the rocks out of the asteroid. You can kind of see the little suction going on there. And then they crunch it up and pull out the ore so that we can utilize it. So that's all very standard. And then, you know, once a day when you log in for the first time, these suckers have a tendency to fill up on you. This one's currently, you know, 14% full. Fills up every three hours. You just hit that button to bank all of those delicious minerals. And then you can go about uh, using them to build other such crazy machinations. Um, sort of like what you can build here at the ship factory, where we build our Star Destroyers, our man ships, our corvettes, our frigates, all sorts of different types of ships, which allow us to uh, talk about how Vega Conflict differs from games like Clash of Clans, or Stormfall, or Hero Storm Siege... I don't know, there's a there's all kinds of games like that. But what Vega Conflict really does to try and distinguish itself from the competition is they allow you to fight with your fleets, which you can see over here. I've got all these different crazy ships and fleets. All of these ships you can control directly in order to um, better command and have strategic control over battles rather than it's simply who has the better statistical number of whatever troop just kind of generically wins. It's not as boring as that, which is great. I love that. So, um, you build ships here, you outfit the fleets here, you put them into groups that fly together and murder stuff, and then we take them into orbit. Alright, so here we are in orbit. We are flying over top of a planet. Our base is right here. It's represented by what uh, an icon that represents the level of our main um, bridge or the main space station behind our base where all of our people live and our workers live and they all do a lot of crazy saucy stuff. 
then around us we've got, you know, these little resource clouds of helium and uh, minerals. And then we've also got people like this Beyonce fellow. Which, um, you know, in this case, Beyonce is defended by four very powerful murdery fleets of ships. And then we've also got, you know, just a spattering of other random players. Some of them are brand spanking new, so they have a protective shield, very standard stuff. There's also all of these cargo freighters moving around, and those are actually Vega um, conscripts that go out to these mineral clouds, and they gather up all the minerals, and they take them in their fleet all the way over... Oh, where is it? Somewhere over... up. Oh, here we are. We've got this um, ore and uh, resource processing center where they take all of their cargo and they process it and send it to the Empire to turn it into fleets and cities and all kinds of stuff. And, well, we're fighting them currently and we don't really want them to get all of that stuff. And neither does our friend up here, Mr. Burr. This man here, he uh, he's a commander inside the Rebel fleets. He's a... Uh, Ship's general commander, maybe fleet admiral would be the best term for him. And one of the first missions he sends us on, in fact, I think he sends us on a mission to kill a level 20 uh, fleet of enemy ships, he sends us out in order to um, intercept all of these saucy devils and keep them from delivering their cargo. And it's also a fantastic way for you as a player to... Um, Farm up some extra materials if you need them in order to build your next cool, awesome ship. So to that effect, we are going to send out one of my little fleets. Uh, I think Space Gump Shrimp will do a nice job. There it is. And, uh, hmm. We're going to probably attack a cargo freighter at about level 5. And this is where things get good. So... Unlike games like uh, Clash of Clans, where you just kind of throw units against each other, or you just send them to attack an enemy formation and you never get to see a cool battle, we have actually got full-on ships that I can individually control and send to murder each other. Very much like I was playing a sort of um, minimalist RTS, um, real-time strategy game, much like StarCraft, on the tablet. Which makes it very interesting and very tactical to arrange your different fleets in very specific orientations in order to tackle different leveled foes and different types of defenses that your fellow players have. You have all sorts of different ships in this game. You've got like little baby frigates and tactical assault ships that are really fast and powerful. You've got slower ships that are very powerful, granted. But, um... They don't really have the same mobility as the smaller ships, so their tactical uses are different. And then you also have a variety of ships that have um, gun emplacements in different locations, which means you have to, say, these big battleships you might see here, that kind of look like uh, lobsters. They have an entirely different sort of um, st strategy about them, because much like a pirate ship in uh, the olden days, or just general ships back when sails were the primary mode of transportation. Um, very similar to that, um, these guns are these big battleships, these huge cruisers, their guns are positioned on the sides, so they strafe and then they release a volley, like an actual battleship from like World War One or World, well maybe not World War One, but like World War Two, where they unleash volleys after volley. Of, uh, of weaponry. So you can really mix and match your strategies in order to get the greatest outcome from your ships that you can. So here we are, facing off against a slightly more deadly um, opponent, and you'll see the lead ship here kind of looks like a crustacean, a little bit like a lobster. And these ships in particular, they fire from the sides. So they position themselves so that their sides are facing the enemy. And then they release a volley of cluster missiles 
or torpedoes like those ones you just saw there in the middle, and they just volley and they do concussive AoE damage all along the enemy front and just annihilate them. And so those are some of the different ships. I'm actually going to recall the ships that I've got out right now. And, um, where do I have them? Here's a good example. We'll utilize my Flak Reacher uh, Armada one more time in order to illustrate the full utility of some of these ships. So Flak Reacher is a different sort of fleet. It's designed to be a long-range snipey fleet. Actually, let's... Let's attack this other one instead. A, sm a slightly smaller fleet that won't beat us up if we uh, decide to get sort of fancy with our tactics, but it will do a good job illustrating the different usages of some of the um, battleships. So the difference here is that we have these cute little long-range destroyer ships here, and their job is to be a long-range sniping cruiser. They fire these very large bolts, and their attack range is very long, but they have almost no close quarters combat capability. These are longbow destroyers. And their job is to sit in the very back and pick at the enemy. So there's all sorts of stuff in this game that you can mix and match with in a, in a very RTS-like fashion in order to play the way that's most comfortable for you. Maybe you play it very long range. Maybe you have a bunch of ships that are really fast and in your face. Completely up to you. So we will recall the uh, last of our ships here. Start repairing our other ships using resources. And we will go back to base and talk a little bit more about how all of these stratagems and powers and abilities work by building ourselves a ship. You can only build one ship at a time, so it kind of limits you as to how many units you can build. Other games with timers like this, you can set up a queue of units to build, and then you can come back in the morning and then all of your units are fresh and ready to use. This game, it's more quality building over quantity. For example, we are going to, I don't know, what are we going to build? We've got Corvettes, which are sort of the lightweight, heavy lifting ship of our fleets. We've got Frigates, which are all very right up in front of you and in your face. We've got cruisers, destroyers, which are long-range attackers. They don't get to have shields. Or battleships, which are the heavy ships that carry, you know, they can carry more weapons that can fire huge volumes. I think what we want is we're going to want, um... Let's build a cool frigate. We have this new Talon-class frigate that's kind of cool. And um, this is the sort of default that I've got it set up in order to build. So we've got, right here, we've got a shield. And this type of shield is a spectral... Wait, no, I think I'm using a deflector shield here. And each one of these shields is specialized in, de in guarding against one specific type of weaponry. Now, they do kind of have some all-around protection, like this is... They've all got about 90% protection. But um, they're most effective at dissipating whatever class of weapon they're meant for. So this is like laser weaponry, right here is the spectral shield. Shockwave is like missiles. Um, then you've got uh, the deflector shield, which is for those blue long range firing plasma bolts. But for my money, um, on a close quarters combat frigate, I'm going to put in the spectral shield which is going to do quite a bit of good work if they have close quarters lasers that fire in rapid succession like a machine gun. Then, um, because this is kind of a close quarters weapon or ship, I have the option of using pulse rays, which are just the standard machine gun. Or I can use the 
slightly more dangerous disruptor ray, which fires a little bit slower, but has a much more devastating impact. And a bit better range. It seems like it has a shorter range, but it's actually got a bit more of effective range to it, I've found. So we'll equip two of these disrupt rays. And then, for a specialty ability, as like a sort of, um, little icing on the cake, we're going to use some focused optics, which is a sort of like a trinketed or specialty item, which increases the general range of all electrical weapons. Then, of course, last, I've got thrusters that make them faster at strafing side to side for personal defense. And then some really strong hull armor, which is great against really heavy weaponry. And then we'll set that build. And that's going to take about four hours, because it's a big, mean, hefty ship. I suppose since we've started building a ship and talking about, like, upgrades and different types of weaponry, you've got explosive weaponry, long-range weaponry, all sorts of stuff to sort of give you options, like these missiles or plasma torpedoes or pilot... Polaron rays and mass drivers. They fall into three primary circuits. High fire rate, medium range laser weapons that are electrical and they shoot a lot, like machine guns. Explosives that fire little photon torpedoes or regular missile torpedoes that explode and do a lot of AoE hull damage. And then you've got those long range plasma bolts, which are great for sniping at targets at long range and staying safely out of reach. So, all of the whole idea here in a game about managing your timers is you always want something building, you always want something re researching, and you always want something like gathering something. And so we've got like, this facility handles ship hulls and research, and the tech lab, and it is a spattering of shields and all sorts of other stuff. We'll actually have this area research a shockwave shield. We want something building, which is re building right here, researching, and um, obviously all these miners are gathering resources from this asteroid. So far, what I've really enjoyed is that there's always a story mission of some variety here, like um, this combat training mission, which helps to give you some background behind what the Vega are doing and also teach you how to do things like assault other players, which we can see in a few minutes here. I also am really enjoying the fact that a lot of games like Vega Conflict, they like to offer you a lot of premium stuff. You know, even a free game, somebody has to pay to maintain it and develop it and do stuff with it. But um, I'm not feeling really over-advertised to, I think, is a good example. And by over-advertised to, I mean so many games, every time you click on an object like here, there's like two or three or four different things trying to get you to pay real-world money for something in the game. And really, the only thing that Vega Conflict is trying to get you to buy is convenience. What do you mean by that, Larry? Well, let's talk about this four hour, whoops, this, this ship factory building a ship, and that's gonna take four hours, but I really want to, before I go to work, before I go pick up the kids, before I go um, out to dinner with some friends, I want to use this ship and to piss off some people out in space and attack their base and do some damage. Well, if I wasn't in an alliance or a guild in this case, um, there wouldn't be a request help button, but after you'd click that, I can instantaneously finish this four hour build for 83 golden coins in the game. Now my frigate is ready. Or let's um go over here to um our arms lab. We could go into here, and then we could Go research something that is incredibly expensive, like this thing. I haven't had a lot of chance before recording this to go farm up a whole boatload of resources like antimatter, which you can only get by killing very high-level combat targets in space or invading other players. 
I need extra resources, and in exchange for 1,400 coins, I can get all those resources, and then I can use a little bit more research to instantly get this item so that I can increase the deadliness of my ships before going out. And really, really the only thing you can get, you can't really buy just bulk resources right off the bat and just speed level yourself into infinity. All you can really do is buy case-by-case case, um, amounts of resources, which is really expensive and ineffective, or you can buy a boost in your base's production of certain materials. It's really not too pricey. It's really not too in-your-face with trying to force premium content at you. It's not constantly trying to offer you you know, an excessive number of really expensive units that aren't very powerful like some other games. It does a nice job of being very sort of straightforward with what it's asking you to spend money on, but more subtle than a lot of other games. Really, I mean, look at this. The only offer here on the screen right now to buy something is this tiny little bonus offer for, you know, if you load in here and buy coins right now, there's a sale going on for in-game currency, and it also offers you some free ships that you can then equip with better weapons and go out and murder stuff. So it's very reasonable. I don't feel nickeled and dimed at all. Um, it's good. The, the interface is very minimal, and it's kind of out of your face for a asking for money. And so many games can be so obnoxious with that. I really appreciate that, and that's nice. It's really easy get resources in this game it's really easy to get research done and if you find yourself not really wanting to spend money on it but maybe some of your alliance mates have spent some money on this game you can request that help you saw like uh, let's hit this request help button that'll cost 27 gold coins now that i've requested help in this alliance tab where i can see all of my friends that are helping each other out in this area. Um, people can all pledge to help with a little bit of their own money, and then that will slowly reduce the time that is left on this research for the Shockwave Shield 2. Likewise, if I feel like repaying the um, favor, I can go through and I can click on some of these people and give them a few coins each in order to help them out. And as you saw, somebody already helped me out, and it slightly decreased the time that I needed to finish that. That was nice. And I just helped a bunch of people just to kind of illustrate what that is, and that only took a little bit of my premium currency. And they also give you a bit of premium currency now and again as you do story missions to learn how to do stuff. So, before we leave, Let's go and murder somebody, because that's that's just how we roll here at the Chupacabra's Lair. We gotta piss someone off. Well, not piss them off, but we gotta, we gotta heckle someone before we end off this review. Here we are in space, and, you know, there's a lot of really powerful people around. A lot of people who leave their fleets floating in space to defend them, so this is a really great deterrent right here from people attacking you, and I could do this too, I just... No one's attacked me, I don't really see the need. Um, but all of these people, they're either really powerful, or they're shielded, and I can't do anything to them. Like, this is, this is a several, this is like a six-day starter shield that Pablo's got, can't do anything to him, doesn't even give me the option to try and attack him. Um, where's another example? Some of these guys, because they're so underleveled in comparison to me, like this guy... Oh, actually, I can't attack him. A lot of the people that are grayed out, you can't attack. They're just, they're either considered too weak, or they've been attacked recently, and you just can't do anything to them. So let's actually attack this guy. I don't know if he's Korean or something, he looks like it. Let's launch my Flak Reacher. This is a fleet that I designed specifically in order to attack people. Well, I hope that's what it's going to be good for. I don't actually know. Oh, I, I can't attack them now. My fleet is too big and powerful, so we'll actually have to 
leave the system and go for an adventure. So, how do you leave the system, Larry? Aren't you locked to this one little map? Oh, no contraire, my friends. Down here, in this little navigation map, I've actually got this third option that looks like a solar system. So here we are, in the solar system, and we've got all these planets that we can do stuff at, and... We've even got some fleets out in the middle of nowhere that we can attack to get bigger and badder um, items from. Oh, and see, here's somebody who just left the planet and is going to go attack somebody. That's kind of cool. So we're actually going to go down here to, to this Ajax planet that, that's controlled primarily by the TEH Alliance. And we're actually going to click on that and we're going to go to view. So now we're in the orbit of some other planet, and you can see that there's some people here that we can attack. Here is a level 20 base. That's about as good as anything else. Let's attack you. And it's going to take about 30 seconds for the Flak Reacher um, crew to go through um, the planetary orbit and arrive and attack the Darth Vader Russian guy. Alrighty, here is our ship arriving from warp. That's what that little circle means. It's warping in. And we are going to go into his base and we are going to attack him. So the first thing you want to do... Oh, this guy is... This guy is like super efficient. Look at him. So... There's a few different threats you have to worry about when you are attacking another player. First are, a lot of people have these mines, and if you drive into this mine, it is just going to annihilate you, pop you right on the noggin, and murder your face. So what we are actually going to do, is we're going to take these longbow cruisers, and we are going to start annihilating these little defense towers here, in the midst of everything. So this guy right here, that's a defense turret. We're going to tell this longbow destroyer to hang on for a second. We're going to deselect him, and we're actually going to look at the ranges of all of these weapons. So we want to put cruisers right here in that sweet spot. So I'm actually going to deploy them. Where was that sweet spot? Hold on. So here we select him. Select that. All right, so right there in that sweet spot right there at the edge of that range. We'll plunk this guy. Then we'll plunk this guy. Plunk you here. And you here. And that should be a pretty decent sweet spot for all of our stuff. Because what we want to do is we want the big meaty ships to eat up all of the damage so that our longbows don't get beat up so bad. That's sort of the tactics here that we're working with. These little... these. Cruisers, they've got better defenses, and that's what we're banking on. This guy's got actually a surprisingly efficient setup here. He's got all of his stuff really close together. Oh, yep, stuff is getting murdered, that is for sure. Normally people try to run you through a gauntlet with those, um, those mines, like I've got set up in my own base. So, we'll just start sending these guys, yep, we are just ripping them up. And what we want to do is we want to destroy the bridge there, in the center of everything. Might be a tall order, because they're really ripping into our stuff. We're just going to send our big ship in to attack. And just hope our longbows can rip into it fast enough for it not to be an issue. Alright, we're about to get that big mothership bridge taken out. It's like our longbows need to get a little closer than I'd like, but we did a substantial- Oh, we got it. Got it. Got it, you guys. Yeah, so, that's what it looks like when you murder somebody, and we didn't get a lot out of it, because I don't think he had much in the way of resources, so that might have been kind of expensive. And it also increased our PvP ranking. So that's sort of the difference you have here in uh, Vega Conflict between 
fighting for like resources in fleets and in different arrangements of units and then fighting for bases where you know some of them you have to fight from a distance some of them you just have to encircle set your units to their different assigned tasks that they specialize in and go for broke or in that case you got to kind of sneak into these little dead zones in their attack range to murder them so my base for defenses is set up a little bit differently I've got a bunch of these high-powered um, defense stations, these combat modules, and they are all surrounded by these mines, these uh, terminus mines, so that they have to be very careful about where they attack, and they can't just all bum-rush me like I kind of did there at the end to destroy his citadel. So, I wholeheartedly recommend um, playing... Vega Conflict, I don't have too many um, gripes. They offer you an AI system for combat if you're kind of bad about doing um, RTS-style movements with a touchscreen as opposed to a mouse. That was something that hung me up initially. And, um, yeah, just... That's really my only gripe about it, you know? It's just a nice game you can sit down at the end of the day and relax and play, attack some people, attack some outposts, do a couple story missions... Then you can set stuff to research, to build, to record. Not record, that's what I'm doing. But uh, to build, to research, to upgrade. And then you can log off for the evening and come back. And the next day there's a bunch of cool stuff waiting for you. And I'm, I'm definitely um, keen on the fact that they don't try to over-advertise to you, too. So, if you're interested in playing Vega Conflict... You can check that out. Uh, there's a link to it in the description of this video. As of the time this video is going up, it should be available on all of the iOS devices, um, especially the iPad that I'm playing it on right now. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps me out a whole bunch, and I will catch you next time. Bye, everybody.